Well, what are we going to learn here today? What is an overactive nervous system? We're going to focus a lot on that. We're going to talk about different types of pain, misconceptions about pain, uh, how the brain produces pain. Uh, we're going to walk through four very specific uh, stages of that. And how viewing pain differently actually, actually helps us rewire the brain. And we're going to also look at when the nervous system is overactive, what are some of the signs that that nervous system is operating the way that it is? So what we're going to start with is this big picture of how the brain seems to process information and uh, create the experience of pain. And I'm going to use this as a, a introduction, very simple introduction. Here's how it goes. When you were in high school, uh, maybe you had a class on uh, the human body in biology and you saw a diagram like this. This is about how the eyes receive information. You can see that the purple is on the top of the object, the orange is on the bottom. It goes in through the lens of the eye and then the image is flipped. And you can see that the purple is now on the bottom and the back of the eye, and the orange is at the top. And then it travels through the optic nerve into the back of the brain, and then this image is formed in the back of the brain. So when we learned that, we all thought to ourselves, wow, I, I guess I understand how vision happens. Well, the truth is, this is not even close to the way vision happens. There isn't a little image shining in the back of our brain that uh, is the mirror of what we are seeing in the outside world. And as we learn about pain, um, and as we have learned about pain, we have often heard and understood things to be uh, operating in a certain way that they just do not operate. And so, I want to start with this as a, a beginning place because many times when I'm sharing this information about chronic pain and how it develops, people will ask me point blank, why was I never told this? Because the things that I'm about to share with you are not the things that we generally understand about pain. It's not what your healthcare professional probably has told you about pain it's going to be just a bit different. So I want to prepare you for that. So how does pain work? Well, I want to start you off with a quiz question. And I actually want you to answer this question throughout the course of uh, our time together in the webinar. So the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And there was a doctor, or is a doctor, while working in Norway, which is in um, Western Europe, of course. And he was in correspondence with some of the doctors, uh, neurologists that he knew in Eastern Europe. So after the Berlin Wall came down, uh, he developed a little bit more of a close relationship with some of the neurologists that he knew. And this doctor, uh, Schrader in Norway, was studying, uh, not studying really, but working with uh, a lot of car accident victims, people who had whiplash. And when he saw people with whiplash, um, he would prescribe heat and rest and anti-inflammatory medications, and many of the people that he see would end up being disabled. And what surprised him was that the neurologists that were working in Eastern Europe, and specifically Lithuania, they did not see any disability from the car accident uh, whiplash victims. And so Dr. Schrader went there and he studied 202 different accident victims and there was no headaches and no neck pain. And he thought, well, that's odd. So he did the study again with a larger sample and he still found the same results. So what was the difference? People were still getting hit from behind um, you know, going from 25 to 35 miles an hour and, um, you know, the physics of it were the same. Why weren't the symptoms the same? Well, then in Germany, there was uh, a man who heard about this and he 
created a very interesting um, opportunity uh, uh, to study this. And what he did is he used a very a sophisticated studio uh, by one of the big car companies in Germany. I don't know if it was BMW or Audi. Uh, but they have an IMAX type theater, and in this IMAX theater they have a car that is bolted to the floor, doesn't move a single inch. But they can create any kind of scenario with uh, sight and sound in this IMAX type theater. And so they began to run scenarios where uh, the, the driver sitting in this absolutely stationary car uh, would... Uh, quote-unquote experience a uh, rear-end collision and what they were able to do is produce whiplash they would have people who would end up with pain and inflammation that would last for four weeks well how do we explain that uh, because physically nothing happened and then in the United States, um, still looking at this issue, someone began to look at demolition derby drivers. Well, now, demolition derbies are probably a thing of the past if we don't have county fairs anymore. Um, but uh, a typical demolition derby driver would be in up to 150 rear-end car collisions in one single day at a county fair and they don't sustain whiplash. So, why would this be? Uh, what can account for these differences when somebody gets whiplash, pain and inflammation, and when somebody doesn't get whiplash? And so, I would like you to, as you apply this information from the seminar tonight, um, uh, today, you know, Put some of these pieces together. So what is an overactive nervous system? This is where I always start off with people as I begin to meet with them. I use a very simple metaphor of a floodlight with a motion sensitive device and that's what you can see in this picture right here. This is a floodlight and this um, Motion sensitive device would work, especially at dark. Animal walks through the backyard and the floodlight turns on and you look out the window and say, oh, there's a deer there. And you think, boy, uh, that floodlight and that motion sensitive, motion sensitive device is working. Well, picture this. It's nighttime and that floodlight suddenly turns on. You look out the window and you see this leaf tumbling through. And you think, oh, good grief, that motion-sensitive device is not working right. Now, you wouldn't go outside and change the, the light. The light isn't the problem. What is not working correctly is the motion-sensitive device. So the way we look at healthcare at our pain rehabilitation program. The way we look at healthcare is all the emphasis in standard medical care is on the light bulb, trying to mask that pain, trying to mask uh, the, the sensations that the person has, uh, trying to get rid of it. You know, it's like changing the light bulb here or putting tape over it. So the light bulb really isn't the problem. The problem is the motion sensitive device, the thing that's in our nervous system that keeps going off way too easily, way too quickly, all the time, so that a person continues to experience pain pretty much regardless of what they do. Rather than having pain just be associated with a significant injury, pain then becomes associated with pretty much any kind of movement, vibration, pressure, touch, um, even sitting. So this, this floodlight is constantly on because that motion sensitive device is now overly reactive. That's what we picture an overreactive nervous system being. Here's a 
very simple picture of what that looks like if you can't quite imagine it in your own brain. You might have experienced this. So picture a young couple that um, starting off life together, they get a small house in a, a neighborhood and they don't have air conditioning. So during the warm summers, they have the windows open at night and maybe a fan blowing. And while they're sleeping, their nervous system is working, right? Uh, they hear their nervous system hears sounds from outside, uh, cars going by, trucks going by, the wind blowing, the rain on the roof, uh, dogs barking, cats fighting. All of these things are happening. Their nervous system is taking that information in while they're sleeping, but the nervous system is set in a certain way, and it's set so that it doesn't treat any of that noise as a problem. It says, oh, that's normal background noise. Well, after some period of time, this couple has a baby. They bring the baby home from the hospital. They go to bed, and they are exhausted. They flop into their bed, and the baby's in the little bassinet, and they go right to sleep. Now, how is their nervous system wired? Well, their nervous system is now set to be on high alert. They still fall asleep. They still hear wind. They still hear noise. But all of a sudden, any kind of noise that they hear, boom, they're up. And they're wired now to be very reactive to everything that happens. And uh, if you've been in this situation yourself, uh, you probably know that a few weeks into this uh, high alert stage when the parents are sleeping, uh, the husband somehow is able to uh, readjust his nervous system and he starts sleeping through the night. And I can remember asking my wife in the morning if she had been up in the night and how the baby was and and she would say with a grump, you know, what had happened and how in the world was I able to sleep through that. And um, I really didn't have an explanation. But my nervous system had gotten recalibrated not to consider the noises that I heard as a threat. So what is pain? Pain is a distressing experience associated with actual or perceived tissue damage with sensory emotional cognitive and social components. So there are two things that I just want to point out uh, about this definition. This is a nice fancy definition, but the two words that are important are actual or perceived tissue damage. So actual tissue damage is a cut. It's a broken bone. Uh, you know, it's some kind of change in our uh, body that has led to the brain saying, oh, that's a threat. So what's perceived tissue damage? Well, perceived tissue damage is when there isn't tissue change, but there is some kind of pain that we experience. Uh, and we call that psychosomatic. Now, psychosomatic isn't necessarily a bad word. It doesn't mean that a person is making up something, uh, but there is this mind-body connection that produces pain. And you've all experienced that. Uh, you know, consider this. If you've ever had chest pain associated with anxiety or stress, is there something physically wrong with your chest? Probably not. Uh, but there is chest pain. Uh, parents are arguing and arguing, and uh, the, the, the child at home uh, listening to that, maybe seven, eight years old, ends up with a stomach ache. Is there a diagnosable physical problem that the child has? No, uh, not really, but there is pain. The brain is saying something's not right and it produces pain. Um, or consider maybe a time that you were uh, very angry and your eye began to twitch. Well, did you have nerve damage um, leading to this um, uh, discharge uh, in your eye so that your eyelid began to twitch? No, you didn't have nerve damage. There wasn't any kind of actual tissue change, but your nervous system was telling you something's not right. So um, pain is associated with both of these things, both actual 
uh, tissue damage and perceived tissue damage. So what are the different types of pain? There's acute pain, usually lasts less than six months, and there's some underlying cause. And here's a little tip. When I'm talking with someone and they begin to explain their pain situation and they use a single finger, just like you see in that, di that image there, um, when that happens, uh, they more or more likely are talking about an acute pain situation because acute pain generally is in a specific spot, one spot. Well, chronic pain, many times when people are talking about that, they don't use a single finger, they use their entire hand and they rub an area that says, oh, my entire knee, and it goes up the side of my leg, right up to my hip, and sometimes up to my shoulder. When people are talking about that, they're talking about chronic pain. And usually this chronic pain is something that uh, was maybe initially associated with acute pain, but not always. And um, there is likely when some kind of um, study is done, there is not real clear evidence that there is ongoing tissue damage or uh, something that the body would be treating as worrisome. So we are going to talk about we have all kinds of degeneration that occurs throughout the course of our life. And as our body deteriorates and discompress and all of that, the body, the brain doesn't treat that as a threat. It's actually something that the brain says that's a normal part of aging. Well, where does our perception of how pain work come from? The type of idea that we have about pain really comes from this uh, old idea that uh, is from Rene Descartes. So Rene Descartes talked about pain being something that you can see the fire there, uh, have an external event, and then you have B, there a nerve, and he pictured that this hollow tube sent this pain information up to the brain, and the brain knew where that pain was occurring. So what was revolutionary about this is uh, Rene Descartes was able to tell people that the brain was the key place where information is being processed, not the heart, which people thought it was the heart up to that time, and um, and that nerves were involved. So, I mean, he, he had some uh, good, interesting ideas there, but they weren't quite exactly what uh, we would consider accurate in our day today. So, what has remained, though, is there are doctors still to this day who will burn nerves and cut nerves um, and try to do uh, repair around nerves based on this idea that pain is actually coming from nerves. And we're going to see that that is actually not the best way to conceptualize how the body produces pain. So here are some misconceptions about pain. The first one is this. We usually think of pain coming from our peripheral nervous system. So we have our brain and our spinal cord. That's our central nervous system. Then we have these nerves that are running throughout the body. 43 miles worth of peripheral nerves running throughout the body. And so if I had a straight pin, I try to, I picture that if I poke my finger with that straight pin, that this little ouch signal would go from my finger to my spine up to my brain and my brain would go, oh, that finger just got poked and it hurts. Well, um, that is not, not actually how it happens. Uh, what happens is those peripheral nerves that we have, we're going to look at each type, um, sends information to the brain that something has changed. And then the brain has to figure out, is that change important? Is, it cha is that change a threat? And if it's not a threat, it won't produce pain. But if the brain thinks that it is a threat, then it will produce pain. So 
The second thing that we have as a misconception is we think that there's a real clear relationship between what happens to us, like what the event is, and what we feel. So we picture a pinprick being a small thing, produce a little bit of pain. If I smack my thumb with a hammer, uh, that's a lot of pain uh, because it's a big event. And I think, boy, that hammer is a big event and it's going to produce a lot of pain because of the tissue damage. Well, that's kind of true, but you know, it's not always true. A sliver can produce a lot of pain. A paper cut can produce a lot of pain. You can look at a carpenter and a, uh, or a mechanic, they smack their thumb, it gets tissue, they have tissue damage just like anybody else, but their experience of pain is not going to be like the experience of pain who's somebody who's not a carpenter. Because a carpenter is able to, they're going to be able to shake their hand, get back to work, and within a few minutes really not be aware anymore of uh, the discomfort in their thumb because their brain doesn't continue to treat it as a threat. So this then becomes confusing. How do we then account for how pain happens? Because you could have a football player, let's say in high school, playing in the state championship and during the game, they end up maybe breaking a bone, but they continue to play unaware of the threat that has happened. Um, why does that happen? Why does that occur? And then you have people, for example, who lost a limb. Uh, they don't even have a peripheral nervous system in some part of their body, but in the absence of their hand or their arm or their foot or their leg, they still have pain. So we have to have a different way of understanding how pain works if we're going to explain all these differences. So the bottom line is pain is not just about damage. Uh, the amount of pain we experience does not relate to the amount of tissue damage. We don't even need tissue damage to experience pain. Uh, and we often have changes in tissue that the brain does not perceive as a threat. So if you measured your height at age 20 and you measure your age, height at age 55, you've already lost some of your natural height. Why? Because you have degenerative disc disease. Um, not necessarily disease, but you have a, a degenerative disc process that is occurring. And as that degenerative process is occurring, your brain doesn't treat it as a threat. And it usually is not treated as a threat until uh, somebody gets uh, an MRI and um, you know a, a healthcare person says, boy, you know, look at this, you know, you have these degenerative discs. And then all of a sudden it seems that this is now not just back pain, but a bad back, which is a completely different way of looking at what's going on in the person's body, which is uh, for all people uh, a natural part of aging. So how do we figure out um, how our nervous system works? Because we have some preconceived ideas. I talked about two misconceptions. So I wanna put these misconceptions to a test and ask you a quiz question. So think back to middle school, high school, some point in your life you're um, you know, in a, a situation where you're falling, quote unquote, in love with someone and um, you're writing notes back and forth. Back in the old days, that's what we used to do or sending text messages, I suppose, what they do now. And uh, the opportunity comes when you're able to uh, sit very close to this person that you're excited to uh, fall in love with and you know, rub shoulders. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's an opportunity for the two of you to hold hands. Let me ask you this question. Uh, what was that physical sensation like? Well, um, for most people, it's like this very powerful electric a sensation of excitement and pleasure and unbelievable uh, in its uh, intensity. So do you have in your hands pleasure sensors? 
So if you are a new parent and you hold your baby for the first time and touch their skin and their little fingers and their toes, and it feels so wonderful to hold that baby in your hands, again, do you have pleasure sensors? Well, actually you don't. You don't have any pleasure sensors in your hands at all. Um, the sense of pleasure is an interpretation from the brain of the sensory information, vibration, pressure, and touch that it's getting. And the brain then produces an output, and that output is going to be pleasure. And let me ask you this, are you always ticklish? And some people would swear that they're always ticklish, um, let's say of their knee, and um, they just see a hand coming toward their knee and they begin to laugh. Well, picture this, if you're in an elevator and you're standing there and there's some creepy, creepy person standing nearby uh, that maybe is, uh, from the looks of it, a criminal and they sneak over toward you and they reach down and touch your knee, would you start laughing? No, you probably wouldn't. Sometimes an itch is quite uh, relieving to scratch, but that scratching doesn't always relieve. It can turn quickly into discomfort or even pain. So how does our nervous system work if we don't have pleasure sensors and we don't specifically have these pain things that are uh, telling us that something is hurting. Well, there are three parts of pain perception. Num number one, there's sensory input, and that's from our peripheral nervous system. And there's analysis, and that's what the brain is trying to figure out, hey, what's going on? And then there's output. If the brain says that there's a threat, then there's going to be discomfort and a message. And this message is, I'm not okay. And so we're going to start looking at examples of how that works. So let me give you a, a, a real quick example. Let's say that there is a, a person walking across an intersection in a big city just pick any big city that you have in mind, um, maybe down in South America, San Paulo or uh, Rio de Janeiro or something like that. They're walking across five lanes of traffic, and while they're walking, there's a pedestrian crosswalk, but while they're walking, traffic is stopped. Halfway across, they stumble and roll their ankle. So all of a sudden, there's sensory input, right? There's tissue damage, the ligaments, uh, tendons that are stretched. Maybe there's some mechanical uh, change in the foot with all the teeny little bones. There's inflammation. That inflammation goes screaming up to the brain for analysis. Now the job of the brain is to protect us and to explain things. And then the brain at that moment says, hmm, this is interesting uh, that uh, this event has occurred, but in this situation, uh, if that person starts focusing on the output of pain, they're going to be standing there in the middle of traffic and not be uh, around for very long. So the output of pain is not an advantage at this moment, so it's not going to get turned on. And so the person is able to literally walk to the other side. Once they're out of harm's way, the brain says, now would be a good time for this output of pain to occur. You might have experienced something like that yourself. I know that I have. So here are the parts that we're going to be looking at in our model today. There's sensory input that comes from the peripheral nerves running throughout the body. There is this analysis that occurs in the spine, in the brain. This is the central nervous system. And then there's this output. The output could be pain, it could be other things as well. Um, and then another alarm system gets set off, uh, which we're going to talk about in greater detail toward the end. And that impact impacts the nerves. Uh, and then this thing kind of becomes this cycle that uh, has a life of its own. And once it has a life of its own, it really doesn't need any sensory input anymore, and a person then ends up with chronic pain. And that becomes a problem. And so we need to know how to break this cycle. So step one is sensory input. So picture 
nerve endings coming in different varieties. We have nerve endings that tell us that there's tissue damage, meaning a cut or a tendon stretch or ligament snap or something like that. Heat, uh, chemical, if you have ever had a small cut and had lemon juice or tomato juice in it, and there's this chemical acid sensor. So the open cuts should not have acid. And so that the brain uh, stops uh, us when that is happening. Uh, mechanical pressure, so think of a disc uh, maybe in the spine protruding a little bit and there's this um, uh, nerve running alongside that gets pressure against it because of that disc sticking out and then that was something we call mechanical pressure. And then there's inflammation. So five different types of nerve endings that are sending information to the spine in the brain to tell us that something is wrong. And now the next step is once that information gets to the spine in the brain, uh, the brain uh, has to uh, figure out uh, what to do with that information. So uh, when I mentioned a pinprick, that pinprick, uh, you know, triggers this nerve signal. One type of nerve signal goes very quickly to the spine and goes right back to the finger without going to the brain. And so that's one of the fast uh, nerve signals that allow us to have a reflex. So even before we experience pain, uh, we can have a reflex reaction uh, from one type of nerve signal. But there's a second type of nerve signal that goes to the brain and it goes much slower. And when it gets up to the brain, then the brain has to figure out, well, what is that? And so I have something there called gate control theory. Um, we're going to get back to that hopefully toward the end. And what I'm going to explain about gate control theory is the amount of information coming from our peripheral nerves to the spine can be restricted if the brain is producing endorphins. Endorphins are uh, neurotransmitters that the brain produces when we experience positive things. So when those endorphins are produced, it travels down the, it doesn't stay in the brain, it travels down the spinal cord and it actually restricts information from getting up the spinal cord just by engaging in things that are pleasurable and meaningful. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So once the brain gets this information, it needs to explain what is happening, which I have mentioned, and it needs to protect us from danger. And so a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about is how the brain becomes overly reactive. And it becomes overly reactive in part because the way the brain is explaining things and protecting us is not necessarily based on correct information. So how does the brain make this conclusion that we're in danger? Well, number one, it will label sensory input. It will say dull, sharp, numb, throbbing, tingling, burning, stinging, biting, um, something like that. It will also link it to a memory. It will say, boy, that sharp pain that it's in your back goes out your hip and goes shooting down your leg. It's just like what happened two weeks ago. And when it does that, it's trying to make a comparison between what you're experiencing now and what you experienced in the past. The problem with that is it might not be true why you're experiencing pain might not have anything to do with why you experienced pain two weeks ago. And you're going to see how that works when the brain makes a connection. So let's just look at this diagram here. Here's this image of three dots. So as soon as the brain sees these three dots, it does something. What it does is it creates a single image out of it. It says, oh, I know what that is. It's a triangle. And as soon as you see, quote unquote, a triangle, it's hard to unsee it. And the brain is like that with our pain as well. So let's say that somebody has a bad back and they're standing at the kitchen sink and they have discomfort in their back while they're standing there. 
So this discomfort increases and the brain goes, okay, what's going on? And the brain says, oh, I know what it is. There's too much standing going on. That's number one. And as the person is looking out the window, they see these dark clouds rolling in and these wind, the wind starts to blow and temperature is dropping and the brain says, oh, reason number two, there's weather change. So weather change, standing, those two things are related to pain. Now, the problem with that, and you can probably guess where I'm going to go, is once the brain makes that connection, it's there in the brain, even if it's not true. So it's not really important whether or not things should be related. If they are related in the brain, the brain then hangs on to that. So let me give you a very clear example of why this becomes a problem. I could have a person sitting in my office that has some kind of difficulty with their knees. Sitting, they're fine. Standing, they're fine. But if they go downstairs, they have a lot of knee pain. All I have to do is have them close their eyes, visualize going down a flight of stairs, and they'll experience pain. Why is that? Because just by bringing up the image of the stairs and bringing up the memory of movement, the brain says, oh, what goes with that is pain. And so a person then experiences pain. Well, another big factor in uh, the brain's analysis is how it's kind of primed to link things together based on past experiences. So to explain this, uh, I need to tap into a little bit of history here. There is a man, Ivan Pavlov, lived over 100 years ago uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia. He was studying the anatomy of dogs, and he couldn't figure out why the dogs would salivate every time the lab workers walked into the lab. So he didn't realize that the dogs were associating the lab workers, lab assistants, with food. And he assumed that, but he couldn't prove it. So he wanted to prove it. So what he did is he gave the dogs food and they would salivate. And then he would pair the food with the ringing of a bell. And he did that many, many times. And then he would take away the food. So once the food was gone, only the bell would ring, ding, and these dogs would salivate. And it didn't matter if it was one week, six months, or a year later, one ring of a bell would cause the dogs to salivate. And it wasn't because the dogs were thinking about it. It was because that part of the brain, the auditory part, and the part that produces the saliva, that part of the brain, those part, two parts of the brain were fired at the same time. And when they fire at the same time, they wire together. So we say neurons that fire together, wire together. Well, let's say that someone has a spinal cord injury and they begin to lose spinal cord fluid. Now, this is a unique situation. It um, doesn't happen every day. But when somebody has a spinal cord injury and they lose spinal cord fluid, the brain produces its maximum amount of pain possible. A person can't stand. They throw up. Uh, they have to be on a special bed where their head is very low and their feet are elevated. And uh, a person can be like that for a long time before they um, uh, have recovery from that terrible injury. But in the meantime, what happens? Every time that person moves, that brain is going to view that movement as a threat. So once a person has that spinal cord healed and the whole repaired and spinal cord fluid pressure is restored, are they pain-free? Not at all. Movement over that course of time is now linked to pain. Not because they have something wrong with their arm or their leg or their head or their back, but because any movement is now linked to pain. So it's my job to help that brain get rewired so that movement is no longer linked to pain. And we're able to do that very, very successfully with people. So beyond um, 
past learning is prediction. I'll just give you a little story about that, that the brain likes to say once there's some discomfort on the horizon, the brain says, oh, this is going to be bad, this is going to last eight hours, or this is going to last 12 hours, or you really overdid it yesterday, you're going to be out all weekend. Have you ever thought about this, that we never question that? Why don't we ever hear the brain say, your pain's going to last two minutes? I don't know, uh, but it doesn't seem to say that. It always gives this dark and dire prediction. Another thing that the brain does is it blames us for the pain that we have. When I see car accident victims, let's say they are at a stop sign, they are hit from behind and pushed into the intersection, hit from the side, it doesn't matter how many people I see like that. They come into my office and they will say, you know, if I would have left work on time that day, I wouldn't have been at that intersection at that time. I even don't usually don't even go down that road. I don't even know why I was there. and uh, Or I was adjusting the radio at just the time that I was hit, and I, I should have been looking in the rearview mirror, and it's really, you know, our brain has this amazing ability to blame ourselves for the discomfort that we have. And when that begins to take place, the story of a person's life begins to change. Because the brain keeps track of who I was, who I am, who I'm going to be in the future. And the brain begins to shift that story, that narrative, so that we begin to picture our lives moving forward as having pain in control. Pain is in the driver's seat, and we become the passenger. And we want to change that narrative so that we're in control, we're deciding what happens, rather than pain being the one that we have to ask permission from to do things. The brain also comes up with all kinds of questions. If you've been to three pain specialists, you've gotten five explanations, and your brain goes, okay, they cannot be all right. Uh, what's going wrong? Um, are they not telling me something? Um, is there something going on that they're not looking for? Uh, do I have something you know that's even more terrible than I could even imagine? Is um, my life uh, over? Am I going to end up in a wheelchair? What's going to happen? Well, let me tell you about the last one, which is rules. And this is probably one of the key points here. So when the brain is coming up with ways to protect us, it's going to create rules. And this is how this looks. Let's say someone wakes up early in the morning and they have chronic pain. And they do this quick inventory. They go, oh, this is stiff over here. I've got some... Uh, soreness down there. Boy, I got a sharp pain starting in that part of my body. And the brain says, oh, you probably overdid it yesterday. And then this prediction shows up. You're going to have 12 hours worth of pain. As soon as the brain does that, the brain kicks in with this protective plan, these rules that you have to follow. So the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take a warm shower, but that warm shower is not going to be enough for this 12 hours worth of pain. You know, it's going to help maybe take 2% off, but that's about it. You're going to have to have a little bit of breakfast, and after you get some food in your stomach, you're going to have to take some over the counter medications. But over the counter stuff is not going to kick it for this kind of pain. It's 12 hours, and over the counter stuff is just not strong enough. So around 10 a.m., you better take some prescribed medicine. And if that's going to work, around noon, you better lay down. Um, and if you can rest a little bit, it might take the edge off. But if you can't rest well, you know, by 2 or 3 in the afternoon, you're going to be in such a brain fog from your pain. And you're going to have to take another pain medication. And once you do that, I mean, you are not good for anything. And you're going to just be in intolerable pain by then. So you might as well cancel all your plans now. And so pretty much the rules that the brain comes up with uh, restrict and narrow that person's life to the point where they hardly do anything. Why is the brain doing that? The brain is doing that for one simple reason. It thinks that the problem is from this sensory information overload, this uh, the, the nerves that are sending this information. And it's going to basically push people toward a room that they can darken and make quiet uh, to reduce sensory input. And when the brain does that, what we have to remember, it's pushing us in a direction that's not going to lead toward healing and health. It's actually pushing us in the wrong direction. 
And in order for recovery to take place, we're going to have to go against some of these rules that the brain is coming up with arbitrarily to protect us because this kind of protection is not what we need for uh, healing and recovery. So step two is uh, another part of analysis. So once the brain has done all of this, um, or I should say while the brain is doing this analysis, another system gets activated and that's emotions. So emotions are a part of everything that we do and they provide us information. So just think of emotions like your taste buds. You take a piece of fresh lettuce, put it in your mouth, you start to chew it and your mouth says, oh, that's good. And then you taste this piece of dirt. You just got this lettuce from a farmer's market and your brain says, hey, that's not safe. Get that out of your mouth. So positive emotions tell us that something is good. Generally, negative emotions tell us that something isn't good. And we have all these negative emotions that begin to show up. Fear, which has to do with our well-being, uh, being threatened. You know, we're not healthy. We're going to end up sick. We're going to end up with surgeries. Uh, anxiety, not having control. Sadness has to do with loss. Anger has to do with a sense of unfairness, an injustice. Frustration, kind of like low-level anger, but there's this constant irritation that comes from chronic pain, never be able to escape it, never get down to a zero. It's always at a two or a three. Sense of helplessness, trying one thing after another to try to make progress and not seeing progress. And once we feel incapable or um, unable to be effective in one area of our life, that thought of I'm ineffective can spread to many areas of our life. And once that happens, we experience depression. Then there's shame. Shame occurs uh, when we feel negatively evaluated by others. Many people with chronic pain actually do not look terrible. They look okay. Well, because of that, um, people will say things. Well, I just saw you doing this with this committee and talking with people here and you seem so happy. You don't look like you have pain. And that really ends up being a difficult and upsetting situation. So step three, the output. If pain reaches a certain level, the brain is going to say, I am not okay. And we will feel something. And that sensation generally is pain. And like I said, it can be other things as well. So how do we put all this together? Well, one of the fancier scientific terms that we use is neuromatrix. Uh, another name for a neuromatrix is a map. So the brain seems to not produce pain in one single area of our brain, but it uses information and data from all parts of the brain, from memory, from thinking, emotions, uh, what's happening socially, uh, our physical sensations, movements, sounds. And once a brain map gets made, all of these systems are linked together. And you really only need to trigger one part of that map to get that whole thing fired up and for pain to be produced. So let me give you a specific story that illustrates that and you'll see how that works. So there was a, a gentleman who during the Vietnam War uh, was a Marine and he was injured and he ended up with shrapnel uh, in one of his legs and he had surgery in Vietnam, was released, went back to the United States. He went to college, went to medical school, became a doctor. And all throughout his medical career, he had periodic piercing leg pain. It would come on suddenly, he'd lose all strength in uh, that leg, and uh, it would be, you know, burning pain. And he already assumed, he assumed that there must have been shrapnel still there, or scar tissue, or something went wrong with the surgery, or there was some nerve damage, and he could never figure it out. And... He was at a conference learning what you're learning today, and he uh, was thinking about this neuromatrix theory, 
And he went outside during the break, and while he was standing outside, he suddenly had that experience of sharp pain in his leg and his strength leaving his leg. And he looked up into the sky, and what did he see? He saw a helicopter. Every time he experienced pain was in the presence and the sound of a helicopter. So his brain had linked all these things together and all it needed was the trigger of the sound or sight of a helicopter to reactivate everything associated with his pain. So let me give you another interesting story. Uh, this is a true story. A construction worker was in a building. He was up on an elevated platform and he jumped down. Uh, he was about five feet high, jumped down, landed on the flooring. But what he didn't see is that there was a spike uh, in the flooring. This spike went right through the bottom of his boot, out the top of his boot. He grabs his foot, uh, screams, his buddies come. He's in the ambulance. He gets pain medication. He says it doesn't do anything. He gets to the hospital. He gets another pain medication, says it doesn't do anything. Short story is the doctor comes, cuts off the bottom of his boot. And I've seen the picture of this boot. Um, separates everything out and um, takes the spike out from between his toes. And he says, you don't even have a scratch. So what happened? So his brain took sensory information, right? Visual information. It labeled it, um, told him a story about that, uh, linked that to memories that he has in his mind of, you know, an industrial accidents that he's seen and heard, uh, made a prediction. Uh, told him he wasn't so smart for jumping off that thing, asked this question, are you going to lose your foot? Are you going to lose your job? How are you going to pay your mortgage, care for your family? Uh, stimulated fear, stimulated anxiety. And that triggered the threshold so that the brain says, yes, there is a threat. There needs to be pain. So that matrix might be a, a simple way for you to understand what needs to happen when you're working with chronic pain. It's not just as simple as I take this medication and it goes away. No, there's need to be a, a, an examination of what kind of brain map is working that's triggering this pain and how can that brain map get dismantled a little bit. So the next step here, and this is the final step, the fourth step, is the stress response. So we have two kinds of stress responses. So when we have chronic pain, it demands that we adjust. Adjustment triggers the stress response. One of the stress responses that we have that everybody's familiar with is kind of the fight, flight, freeze response. This is all the physical changes that happen, increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, and adrenaline. Uh, cortisol, change in blood flow so that your hands become cold, feet become cold, blood goes to the core of the body. And that is going to lead to increased pain. And unfortunately, with chronic pain, you have a chronic increased level of stress and that stress itself is going to amplify the pain, increase the pain. But there's something more important happening with the stress response and that's our immune system. So our immune system is triggered by the stress response. So when you're in a potential car accident, not even in a real car accident, it almost happens, right? You hear the screeching of tires and your body prepares. In that instant, your lymph glands and other glands release these blood cells that are ready to fight infection. One of them being the white blood cells. There are many others, but these preparations happen for you if you get cut or if you have a broken bone, your immune system is ready to help. And if there isn't an accident and you're not cut, then your kidneys and other organs will process these extra white blood cells and get rid of them and no damage is done. So now picture this. Let's say that your stress response isn't just elevated once with a car accident, but it's elevated every day, every day, day after day, day after day. What's going to happen? Well that immune system response is going to lead to inflammation in some kind of organ. It could be your intestines. It could be your colon. It could be uh, you end up with an enlarged thyroid. It could be that 
uh, you have uh, dry eyes or dermatitis or hives, uh, any number of things, but it will definitely cause an inflammation of your joints, your tendons, your muscles, your ligaments, uh, and your fascia that runs throughout everything, and it will hurt. It will change the way your nerves function so that you end up with an oversensitive nervous system. So the three signs of an oversensitive nervous system is that pain spreads. It, rather than using your finger to point where the pain is, now your whole body, regardless of what happens, begins to get interpreted by the brain as if something is wrong. Instead of just saying, my knee hurts with uh, achiness, a person will say, I have aching, burning, throbbing, numb, tingling, biting, uh, frozen um, pain. And all of these new words start to become, you know, the vocabulary for describing what's happening. And then we also see that non-pain input leads to pain. Well, what does that mean? It means light touch, a type of fabric, a breeze, light, sound, things that the brain should just interpret as background noise. Now the brain interprets as a possible threat. Now we're in that situation like we talked about in the beginning, that motion sensitive device and the floodlight. Now anything that happens is going to get treated by the brain as if it's a problem and that's what chronic pain is. And so when we're talking with people, one of the things that we often ask at the beginning of the program is if they have any autoimmune disorders. And many of the people, not all, many of the people that we see do have a variety of other autoimmune disorders. And what the people usually don't realize, even if they have two or three different disorders, is that almost all their disorders are treated in the same way, which is some form of cortisol. Um, and cortisol is produced by the adrenal glands, but becomes fatigued in a sense. And, and the body then needs extra cortisol, which is used by the body to suppress the overactive immune system. So what we've learned today is that our nervous system can become overactive, um, that we have many different types of pain, and that we have a lot of misconceptions about how pain is produced. And we really need to understand that pain is produced by analysis in this map that we have in the brain. And that map is something that we can rewire. One of the steps that we help people uh, start with in our program is to learn this simple phrase, that pain does not equal harm. Typically, when we experience pain, we picture damage being done because of that pain. And in most situations in chronic pain, there isn't harm being done. Pain comes, it flares up, it goes, it's at random, it shows up at night, in the middle of the day when they're sitting. It's not because something mechanical is happening or damage is being done. But we assume that pain is equal to damage. And that stops people from doing things because they don't want to hurt themselves. Well we need to learn that pain does not equal harm and that when you're sore, you're actually safe. When you're sore, you're beginning to do things generally, walking, stretching, exercising, using exercise bands, being in a pool, um, doing things, standing, you know, that your muscles aren't used to doing. And when you begin to do things, your muscles are going to complain. So what I've done is taken the information that I shared with you today and I put it in a book and uh, it's available now to be ordered and it's on Amazon and you can look for that and what I cover is an in-depth explanation many chapters on the things that I was sharing with you today and then I go into how to calm the nervous system and how to slow things down uh, so that the brain isn't so overly reactive and then how to deal with the difficulty of pain in our life every day because it is linked with depression, it's linked with stress, it's linked with uh, relationship problems, it's linked with job problems, it's linked with anxiety, all of these things. How do you deal with the difficulties that we have 
uh, emotionally that come along with pain and do it with flexibility so that we can keep moving forward and not get stuck. So that's available and I hope you uh, are able to find that on Amazon. And I just want to thank you for attending and we will uh, hopefully talk again soon. And I so appreciate uh, the work that uh, you've done to show up today and hopefully um, find some information that has been helpful to you. Take care.